Many are makbid not to eat in the base. Many are makbid not to eat the base medrash, even though Allah allows it. Why isn't smoking and vaping a violation of covered base medrash? What? Why isn't smoking what? Yeah, smoking and vaping. Oh, and vaping. <laughs> Well, yeah, yes. The question is that um, according to the halacha, uh, you are allowed to eat in a base hamedrish. Uh, you're not allowed to eat in a base knesses. A base knesses is a room that's only used for davening. A base hamedrish is used for learning primarily, but also davening. So interestingly enough, although the holiness of a base hamedrish is greater than a base knesses, because it's both a place of Torah and a place of prayer, but Lemaise, we have certain leniencies because we don't want to force people to stop learning to leave. So as a result, uh, it is permitted to eat something in a base of Medrash uh, and, and the like. <coughs> some people are machmir not to, uh, I, although I haven't met that many people who are machmir not to, but some people will indeed not have a drink even uh, in a base of Medrash, and that's uh, because of the covet of the base of Medrash. So you're asking, the, or the question is being asked, what about smoking and vaping? Uh, so first, I want to make a point that I am not discussing whether you're permitted at all to smoke or to vape. Uh, that, that's an issue of sakana. But let's assume for purposes of argument that you're allowed to do it. Uh, is it an activity that is allowed in a Beis HaMedrish or not? So again, it would seem, it would seem that it would have the same status as eating or drinking. Because if it's something that a person feels they need to do, they get restless, they get anxious. So the halacha makes an accommodation to let you do it in here instead of having to leave and be mavatal Torah. So I think the same would hold true for smoking as well. I mean, after all, uh, the need to smoke can be as every bit as powerful as the need to eat. Uh, the addiction might even be stronger. So uh, I would think this would be nichlal in the heter of eating. But on the other hand, those who don't eat in a base medrash certainly should not smoke in a base medrash either. Now, let me point out that with smoking, there is another concern, besides the health concern generally, and that is the impact you're having on other people. Uh, that is not only the second-hand smoking health issue, which is a matter of controversy and debate, but even if it's not an issue of you know, giving somebody lung cancer, it's simply an issue of discomfort and uh, you know, making the environment not pleasant, you may have an achrayas not to uh, create uh, an unpleasant atmosphere for other people. So that's a Bein Adam Lechavera rule that's very important. On the other hand, I saw something at a chasna once which really, really rubbed me the wrong way. Uh, you know, the chasna had a hall that said no smoking in the hall. Okay, that, that's standard procedure. And there were two elderly chasidim who were sitting at a table smoking. And a young guy, like a guy your age, like went over to the two chasidim, pulled the cigarettes out of their mouths and like extinguished it. Uh, that I think uh, there's a certain mukim for Derek Eretz. I mean, maybe you could ask somebody not to smoke or whatever it is. But that type of aggressive behavior, particularly to someone who was older than you, and it could be they were Tamadei Chachamim as well, I don't know, but whatever it is, uh, you know, don't be a fanatic to uh, your particular cause. Uh, if you claim that you're very sensitive to smoke, then maybe you can step out. But, you know, you don't necessarily have to grab the cigarettes away from somebody. But putting that aside, uh, if you don't f factor in those things, I think smoking would be included in the heter of eating. By the way, one little point about this. The stipler once said, this is Rav Chaim Kineski's father, once said that he forgives every Jew that has ever hurt him except for the yeshiva bacher that introduced him to smoking. <laughs> I mean, it's a pretty serious statement, he says, the stipler. He said, uh, the stipler, well, well, Chaim Kanevsky's father was Rav Yaakov Yisrael Kanevsky, and he was known as the stipler Gaon because he came from a town in the Ukraine called Hornos Stipel. So when we say the stipler, referring to uh, Rav Chaim Kanevsky's father, who was, who was one of the great Gedoli Ador, he was the Chazanish's brother-in-law. He married the Chazanish's uh, sister. Uh, so that's uh, an important uh, point. Rev Dessler also, another thing about smoking that comes out, Rev Dessler uses smoking as an example. In fact, he, had, he was very humble to use this example about himself. How uh, we think we are Balei Bechira. We think we can make free will. We can always choose. Right? It's so easy. Rev Dessler, in his honesty, documents the struggles he had to try to give up smoking. And he said, like, every time he thought he beat it, you know, it came back and it conquered him again. 
and he was saying, this is the Yetzir Hara. Uh, you know, again, uh, he didn't have a Yetzir Hara to go and eat tray for, or, or, or be mazana. That wasn't, but, but the struggle with smoking was emblematic of how difficult it is to get rid of bad habits. It is very, very difficult. Yeah. <clears throat> Why would Hashem design a system where impurity would even be a factor at all? Too much. With so many complexities to being purified, why have it in the first place? Yeah, well, once again, uh, there is a general idea that we only appreciate light when we are confronted with darkness. We only appreciate health when, it, when, when we are confronted with sickness. Uh, in a sense, you need all of the negatives and all of the uh, opposites in the world in order to fully experience the joy of purity and redemption. Now, if we understand that Tuma in its various forms is a form of distance from God, and purity in its various forms is a form of closeness to God, you need the aspects of distance in order to relish and appreciate the closeness. Now, Tuma itself is enormously uh, complicated uh, because the Rambam actually says that Tuma and Tara are not metaphysical states of being uh, they are simply halachic technicalities. Me meaning, according to the Rambam, a Tomei person is no different than a Tohar person. The only thing we say is, when a person is Tomei, that's a shorthand for a bunch of things he can't do. In other words, you're Tomei, therefore you can't go to the base of Mikdash, you can't eat Korban. Meaning, it's not a state. Tomei is not a state. It's just the label we attach to a person that has a bunch of laws connected to their identity. So it's not a metaphysical reality, meaning we don't say, oh, you're not allowed to go to the base of Mikdash because you are Tomei. It's the other way around. Since a guy that touched their dead body cannot go to the base of Mikdash, we call that Tuma. Now, the Mekubalim absolutely reject that idea. Uh, and they basically say that Tuma is like a spiritual state a state of distancing, a state of lesser connection to God. And the halachos don't define the labels the other way around. The halachos emanate from the status of being, of being Tumet. That would be the Pashat Pshat, because according to the Rambam's formulation, it turns out Tum of Atayra are totally arbitrary rules. Meaning you're simply saying, oh, I touch a dead body, I'm not allowed to go to the temple. Why, why you know, if it's not an actual state that you've contracted, then why would these other halachas emanate? But going back to your question, I think basically we need the distance to appreciate the closeness. And uh, that's why there is this concept of, of tuma in the world. Now, in a more metaphysical way, let me just remind you, Rav Hirsch notes that all tuma is connected to death. Now, in some cases, that's very obvious. You touch a dead body, right, your tame. But even less obvious cases are connected to death. For example, a seminal emission is the potential loss of sperm that could have created a pregnancy. Nida is the shedding of the uterine lining that could have sustained life. Um, even childbirth, which is a tumor, right, is because there's a life within the woman that is no longer there. Every childbirth is a form of, of death in and of itself. So Rav Hirsch points out what makes a person tame is whenever you encounter death, you are re-experiencing the sin of the eight sadas in the Garden of Eden that brought death into the world. Meaning to say we are reminded of our imperfections. And therefore tuma, in a rationalistic standpoint, is connection with death reminds man of their rebelliousness against God and therefore we need a certain tshuva, which is done through the purification rituals that then give us access to the temple, which is Gan Eden on earth. Meaning the exclusion of the Tame from the Beis Hamikdash is exactly the same as the expulsion of Adam Harishan from Gan Eden uh, because of the chait of the Eitz Hadas. Right? That's uh, somewhat what refers his understanding of Tuma and Mikdash and uh, the chait of the Eitz Hadas. Yeah. So the Rambam and Derech Hashem he talks about how the the days like the the Chagim the Ragalim have like a spiritual kofa uh, to them that um, in each day we're like reliving that that spiritual energy and 
was uh, also for the Omer, where I think you mentioned recently, I think like the Ramban, I, I don't remember who said, like it's uh, like Ketzat Chol uh, Moed, um, and so it has a spiritual energy of Simcha. Um, now, the that we that we uh, take in this semi avelut of uh, of uh, what happened to the community of Rabbi Akiva. Does this mean? Does this thing mean that we're like mavatel the spiritual energy? How does that work out with the Ram Paul saying there's a spiritual right, energy? Right, right. And does that mean that events in history can have an impact on the spiritual energy of the day and how we experience that? And I mean. The, the, like some, what some people have said about like Yom Atzmaut, like that, that, that's just another event in history that overrides another event in history. And really, <laughs> yeah. you're like, how do we balance yeah. that out? And say, yeah, like, what's, right, right, yeah. right. No, that, 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 those are excellent questions. Uh, first of all, the Ramchal's basic point, which is a cornerstone of Kabbalah and Hasidus, uh, is the notion that uh, time in Judaism is not linear, but it is cyclical. Meaning linear means you simply move from a past to a present to a future. And what happened by Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim was thousands of years ago, and you're just remembering it. In Judaism, time goes in a circle, and when certain dates come, you're getting the same spiritual. It's the same Pesach as our forefathers had in Mitzrayim. Now granted, we're not physical slaves, so the freedom will manifest itself in a different way. Uh, that is the Yisod, that the holiness of time is not commemorative, but it's experiential, meaning you are actually going through that same moment uh, in terms of spiritual powers. That's a very, very fundamental idea in understanding the holiness of time. It is not commemoration, it is experience. Now the question becomes, <coughs> Uh, well, historical events come and go, and they change, and the Omer is a preparation for Torah, which is a time of joy, and yet we superimpose on the Omer the sadness of the deaths of Rabbi Akiva. Uh, does that change the spiritual energy? Does it go from joy? Does it go from sadness? Or is there kind of uh, a period, meaning to say, this all was defined by something at a certain date, and what happens after that date you know, doesn't mean anything. So, in terms of Omer, I know you mentioned Yom Atzimut, which I'll get to, but in terms of Omer, the idea of happy versus sad, I would actually say that that is not an interference in spiritual energies, but rather the basic spiritual energy is to ready our neshamos to receive the light of God's Torah. And in order to ready our neshamos to receive the light of God's Torah, there are a number of steps we have to take. We have to have the joy of learning and the joy of mitzvahs and the commitment. And we have to be misake in hatred and rivalry and polarization, which we do by commemorating uh, the deaths of the students of Rabbi Akiva, who died because they did not show proper respect and regard for each other. So on one hand, you can say it's a contradiction because sad versus happy. On the other hand, at a higher level, it's not really a contradiction. It's really two different and complementary perspectives of how we cleanse our neshamos to be ready to receive God's Torah. One is by the joy in our Torah learning, and the other is by remembering how destructive it is when there's polarization and dissension between Jews. Right? So in that way, I don't think you're interfering in any way with the spiritual energies. Uh, the only danger is that sometimes we might allow the Avelas to make us forget the Simcha. And that indeed would be incorrect. Uh, there should be that Simcha even in the Sviras of the Omer uh, itself. Now in terms of Yom Atzmut though, which you know, once again, that seems to be interrupting, so to speak, the Avelas of Svira. Uh, again, you know, and maybe this will come out, I, I, my guess is probably in other questions that will come down the pike. Like it all depends on how you view Yom Atzmut. Meaning, say, if you view Yom Atzmut as like a heavenly gift from God that He's uh, paving the way for Mashiach by giving us Eretz Yisrael, then you can look at it as part of the process. Just like the ninth of Av is going to be converted from a day of sadness to a day of joy, one might say that this is the beginning process of reclaiming Svira Saomer to be times of joy rather than times of sadness. Starting with Yom Atzmut and starting and continuing with Yom Yerushalayim on the 28th of year. So we have two days of year. 
uh, that in the modern Israeli calendar uh, have become very happy and joyous days. So yes, I think it is. But if you believe that Hashem operates in history and he has a continuous operation in history, spiritual energies can be adjusted, can be modified. There can be different and new dimensions that are added to the mix. But this presupposes a certain ideological view of Yom Ha'atzmaut that not everybody would share, right? So in a sense, you have to define your stance to the holiday, and then you can determine whether it legitimately affects these spiritual energies <coughs> that are coming down the pike. Yeah. Um, why was the punishment of the Tamidi Rebbe Kiva um, uh, like do justice for like the seemingly uh, minor yeah, so we go back to the idea that 24,000 students, that's larger than the largest yeshiva in the world even today. I mean, it's un unbelievable. One rabbi would have 24,000 students without a microphone or a public address system or any of those things. Uh, and they all died, virtually all. There were a few that survived. They all died between Pesach and Shavuos. It seems to be in one year, although it's not clear. Uh, theoretically, you could actually learn the Gemara. They died over several years, but let's assume one year, which is the way most people understand it. And the Gemara in Yavamo says they died because they did not show proper kavod to each other. Let's spend a moment on that. Kavod means honor, respect. Now, Rabbi Akiva was a great man. He was the greatest of the sages. And one can assume that if you were a student of Rabbi Akiva, you were a great person also. You couldn't just walk in off the street and say, I want to be in Rabbi Akiva's shir. I mean, listen, it's hard to get into Rabbi Kanek's shir, you know? Uh, so you're not going to get into Rabbi Akiva's shir. It's not going to be so easy. So we have to assume that every Talmud of Rabbi Akiva was a great person. So what would be if I could see how they behaved uh, 2,000 years ago? Were they pushing each other out of line? Were they saying, oh, you're an idiot, get out of here? I assume that if we would look at the behavior of the students of Rabbi Akiva, we would see Derech Eretz, we would see Meshlekait, we would see proper behavior, all of the halachos would be kept, everything would be kept. Only God could tell that something was a little off. Now what was it that was off if all of the behaviors were right? So here Rav Shimshon Afal Hirsch gives a very beautiful, beautiful etymology for the word kavot, a uh, word origin, kavot. Kavot comes from the same root as kaved, which means heavy, heaviness. Now, heaviness, and even in English, can refer to significance. Like you talk about this person is a heavyweight, or this person has gravitas, or this, per this person's understanding of things is weighty. So we use weighty in matters other than physical weight to refer to this guy has heft. This guy, when he says something, there's something behind it, something waiting. So here's what Rav Hirsch says. Having kavod for a person does not mean you're polite. It doesn't just mean you're nice. Because I could be nice to somebody, but I fundamentally regard them as a lightweight. Meaning, yeah, I'll, I'll be nice to you because I'm nice to everybody, so uh, even though you're worthless, I'll be nice to you. I mean, that's what a person might be thinking. That's not kavod. Kavod is when you strive to see the significance of another person. And for some reason, we still have to explain this, the students of Rabbi Akiva fell short. Now maybe one might speculate, just a speculation, that when you link yourself up to the greatest of the greatest of the greatest, so you make what is called a vertical connection with spirituality. You don't make a horizontal connection, meaning to say, I look to Rabbi Akiva, what do I need you for? You know, what are you, what are you, what are you going to teach me? But that was a big mistake, because as Chazal say, I learned so much from my Rebbe's, and I learned more from my Chaverim, from my colleagues, and from my students, learned most of all. So according to their Madrega, meaning if you would have looked at them, you wouldn't have even seen an Avera. Now, that actually makes your question Worse, because your question was, why should they die over something like that? And now I'm telling you, even their behavior was okay. It was a certain inner attitude. So for that, they deserve to die. Do you get the death penalty? Because you don't show other people the proper cover? <coughs> the short answer is that most of us would not get, Baruch Hashem, we would not get the death penalty. 
for not showing proper covenant. But these were the leaders of the next generation. These were the transmitters of Torah. These were the ones who were going to be the role models and gedolim. And Hashem is saying, you want to be a role model for Am Yisrael. You want to be a gadol for Am Yisrael. You want to be a leader for Am Yisrael. You have to be a paragon of love and care and rachamim and kavod, seeing the chashivas in other people. If you cannot meet those qualifications, good, you can be a good Jew and live as a good Jew, but you cannot be a leader of Am Yisrael. And therefore Hashem took them precisely because they were going to be the leaders and they were going to be the gedolim. Uh, and that's an, that's an amazing thing. That actually tells you that the condition to being a true Gadol in Am Yisrael, one of the, I mean, there are many conditions, but one of the conditions is a genuine, genuine Avas Yisrael and seeing the good and seeing the kavot uh, in other people. You know, Rav Steinman, as a Chorin Levracha, great, great Gadol that we lost a few years ago. So, you know, Rav Steinman uh, exemplified this in such a, I mean, all Gadolim do, but in a noticeable way, he exemplified this. You know, he lived uh, really in total poverty. I mean, he lived in a shack. He and his Rebetzin lived in the equivalent of a shack. I mean, you look at it, uh, and what he ate, I mean, he could have, he actually could have lived at a higher standard, but he was perfectly, he and his Rebetzin, I should add, were perfectly happy living in poverty. And uh, whatever he ate, I don't remember the details, but something like he would eat like uh, one boiled potato a day and he would drink the water as soup, you know, you know things, things like that. In fact, somebody once said, you know, why don't you have a piece of meat or fish? He says, so he said, uh, you don't know how good this tastes. You know, this, this potato water, you know, it tastes pretty good. You wanna, he said, you want to try it. Uh, so, people would come, <laughs> so people would come to Rav Steinman and they would be embarrassed because they're saying, you know, things like, Oh, you know, I've had this car for five years and I'm just wondering if I should buy a new car. <laughs> you know, it's a little embarrassing. You're talking to somebody who's like living in a shack with, with holes in the wall. Saying, mm, I've had this car, but you know, maybe it's not. <laughs> but the funny thing was, people say, I mean, I, I did not have the schuss to talk to him, but people say that they never felt uncomfortable talking to him. Like he would go through, my, the car does this and does that, because he understood that people are on different madregos. And what he does may not be for everybody, but he still had this basic respect for people, for Yidden, that what they're doing is legitimate. And there was a sense of cover that you always felt that you were valued, even though you knew that you were nowhere near him in any, any madrega, but there was never a sense that he was looking down at you, that he's so much better than you looking down at you. Uh, although there's one, one Maisa that went the opposite direction, which is also a tremendous musser. A guy, came, a guy came in to him, and the guy was a wealthy businessman. And he said that he needs to get a new car, he said, but he's afraid of an Ayin Hara. People will look at him and they'll be jealous, and that's Ayin Hara. So Steinman really was playing straight man here. He said, Ayin Hara, ah, that's something very, very serious. He said to the man, um, have you finished us? He says, well, no, I haven't finished Shaz. He says, do you learn every day? He said, not, not every day. So Steinman thinks for a moment and says, so I'm not sure, why, why will people be jealous of you? He says, <laughs> he says what the, what's, what's the high and higher going to be? <laughs> so that was kind of a little bit of, uh, that was a little, little bit of muster. But even that was very, very, very gentle. So I think the lesson of Rabbi Akiva is, what a Talmud Chacham needs to be, and certainly what a Jewish leader needs to be. A Jewish leader that doesn't have love and respect, not just love, but kavod, for other Yidin, is not worthy of being uh, a leader. Yeah? In reading, like, Nach, like, especially with, like, David Amelik and Shaul, like, before he's king, there's a concept of having a government that is legitimate, but can be evil and legitimate at the same time. And sometimes when I hear, this is sort of like, I guess, a Yom Hatzmut question, because sometimes I hear a lot of people use the, who you might describe as like anti-Zionist, and they give all these antidotal uh, situations of the early Zionists, you know, making people secular and ripping off past and stuff like this. And my question is, are, is this, are these sort of uh, stories kind of irrelevant? Um, or is it more of like what, like what you like it like if you read it in in Gemara, it's like Ketubas, uh, Kuf, um, Kuf you know, Kuf yeah. Yud, mm -hmm. Like, do are the Gedolim that are anti-Zionist? Do they tend to have that kind of an argument more? Like, do they or do they 
or is it mostly just antidotes about people being mistreated because of religion? Yeah, so, so you have to understand that uh, just as Zionism is a complicated phenomenon that has different manifestations, anti-Zionism is also a complicated phenomenon that breaks down into different schools. One school of anti-Zionism, which is the Neturei Karta Shita, is that a Jewish state is simply forbidden until the coming of Mashiach. It's very important to understand this. Neturei Karta's opposition to the state of Israel is not because many of the people in the state are not religious. Even if this would be a state in which every member of the Knesset and every cabinet member uh, would be learning in Kolo half a day and uh, only eat Badat Sashkachos and be totally halachically observant, the very act of statehood itself is sinful because when God put us into Galos, he does not permit us to end the Galos until Mashiach comes. So that's the Neturei Karta position. Now I want to point out that for you know, most people, you know, that sounds pretty extreme, but you know, I want to say, but before 1948, that was a position that was considerably accepted in many, many segments of the Haredi world. I mean, they, didn't, they didn't call it Haredi in those days. Rav Shimshon Afal Hirsch, who we wouldn't even call Haredi necessarily in the 19th century, actually said Jews shouldn't have a state until Mashiach comes. I mean, that's before there was any real activity uh, towards a state. Uh, the Briskarov, many, many, even Chabad, which became kind of a Zionist Hasidus uh, under the realm of, of the last Rebbe, but the Rebbe Rashab, Rav Sholom Ber, actually said, Beferish, uh, you're not allowed to have a state, you know, until Mashiach, Mashiach comes. So that's, that's one extreme of anti-Zionism. There's another uh, aspect of anti-Zionism that says you're not allowed to collaborate with people who don't believe in Torah and mitzvos. In other words, they emphasized that when you strengthen the state, you are making coalitions, you are working with poor ke'ol, people who throw over the, the yoke of, of heaven, uh, and therefore the problem is not so much the idea of a state, but the people that you are working with, supporting, by definition, endorsing. And that is where the anecdotes will come in as to all of the bad things that Zionists did or didn't do, whatever it would be, going back to uh, World War II, not saving Jews. I mean, as you know, this goes back. I mean, you have to understand that a lot of the bitterness that uh, many Haredim have towards the modern state of Israel is rooted in some very, very awful historical events, such as uh, what happened even during the Holocaust, what happened to what are called the Yaldei Tehran, in which there were European children brought over, and uh, they were forced into non-religious uh, environments, and uh, Yemenite children were literally kidnapped from their parents and raised, you know, their parents were told that the kids were dead. There were some awful things that were done, and, and, um, and, and again, there are books about this written not by religious people, written by non-religious historians who have tried to uncover what you might call the seamy side of Zionism. I will say, though, La Niestaiti, maybe it's a little controversial, uh, that uh, the modern secularists uh, are, not, are not as bad in some ways. Meaning they're secular, they're ignorant, uh, but this idea of surreptitiously kidnapping children I don't think uh, would be done today. In those days it was sometimes done, uh, and, and, and the like. So you do have the shita that's against the state, which by definition would mean the state of Israel is not a legitimate government. And then you have the shita that acknowledges the possibility of statehood but feels you cannot collaborate with your shayim. Now, if you took that position, then the legitimacy of even an evil government would be very, very interesting because take the Book of Kings, the book Sefer Malachim. Sefer Malachim gives us the hereditary monarchies of both the 10 tribes and uh, the two, two tribes, Yehuda and Binyamin, right, the Malchus based of it. And many of those kings were not good people. Some were righteous, but many were not righteous. And yet, as far as we know, they were still considered to be legitimate monarchs who were sinners and sinful, but that did not deprive the legitimacy of their actions to the degree that they weren't violating the Torah in those particular actions. Now, the Rambam makes the same point about Hanukkah. The Rambam says, why do we celebrate a holiday called Hanukkah? So many of us might say, oh, it's the miracle of the candles, 
or it's the miracle of rededicating the temple, right? That's a good reason. The Rambam says we celebrate Hanukkah because it represents the reestablishment of Jewish sovereignty over the land of Israel by being redeemed from Greek oppression. It's Yom HaTzmut. The Rambam says Hanukkah is a celebration of a Yom HaTzmut. Now, we know that although the original Maccabees were very righteous people, we also know that their descendants of the Hasmonean kings, the Malchi Hashmonai, became Hellenists, became persecutors of the Chachamim, right? Became, in a way, it's like George Orwell's book on the Russian uh, Revolution, or his parody, uh, was it Animal, uh, Animal Farm? And uh, basically what happens is that sometimes the revolutionaries become the very thing they were fighting against. The Maccabees are fighting against Hellenism. And what do they establish? A Hellenist dynasty. Very fascinating. But the Rambam seems to say even that is cause for celebration. So it seems that you have a fairly symbol proof from the Rambam that uh, sinful monarchies do not necessarily become illegitimate monarchies. And there is still something to rejoice in in there being a Jewish statehood. That doesn't mean it's beyond criticism, and it doesn't mean you try not to make it better, and it doesn't mean you accept things that are anti-Torah, but it does mean that there is a significance in the Jewish people having control over, over Eretz Yisrael. So I would say, therefore, uh, your question would depend on why you're anti-Zionist. If you're anti-Zionist because you believe statehood itself is illegitimate, then by definition there would be nothing to rejoice about. If, on the other hand, you recognize status is legitimate and good, but you simply are concerned with the anti-Torah content, then I think there would still be a mockum for legitimacy in what God gave us, even if it's not uh, everything that we would want it, want it to be. You know, there also is a problem, too. I mean, uh, Yoir Lapid, who is not a role model for, for any Jewish person, Yoir Lapid is uh, very, very, very far uh, from Torah values in many ways. Um, but he did make a speech a few years ago that was, I thought, a quite compelling speech. Uh, he addressed uh, the, the amorphous Haredim population. And he said to the Haredim, yeah. the Haredim, who are the Haredim? But he said to the Haredim, okay, you guys won. You guys established yourself as a big, powerful, influential force in society. We thought you would die out. That was a Ben-Gurion thought. But you have staying power. You won. Ah, but now that you won, you got to take responsibility. When the Haredi world, like in the 1940s or 50s, was a tiny little sliver of you know, 400 people, so they could protest about the big bad government was doing all these bad things. OK. But now that you're a major power block in Israeli society, you can't go around looking at other people and blaming them for things not going right. You have to take responsibility. Which means, in other words, ideally, the Haredi world should develop, you know, what is, you know, uh, ask a Rosh Hashiva, what is your position on global warming? You know, what is your position on poverty, right? In other words, in some ways, we're underdeveloped in certain areas because we haven't focused on what is the Torah approach to running a modern state. We've been letting other people do it and then complaining all the time because they're not doing it right. Lapid's point was, you're big enough to be part of that process. And that's a fascinating question. Uh, I will tell you that the first chief rabbi of Israel, of the Medina Israel, who was a big, big Talmud Chacham, Rav Yitzchak Halevi Herzog, he's the grandfather of the, unfortunately, non-religious president of the state of Israel. It's his namesake, Yitzchak Herzog, and this is the, the president of Israel is Yitzchak Herzog. But Yitzchak Herzog Sr., Harav, was a real guy in an tzaddik. I mean, he was kind of almost Rabbi Yashiv's Rebbe in some ways. Rabbi Yashiv had tremendous, tremendous respect. Although the Haredi world didn't respect him so much, but Rabbi Yashiv personally respected him tremendously. And Rav Herzog had this grand vision because he was also a lawyer. He knew law, he knew secular law. And he had this vision that in a Jewish state, we have to develop how halacha deals 
with all aspects of a modern state. How would a police department operate in halachic guidelines, fire department, military security, right? We can't just assume, oh, let the goyim do it, let the chilonim do it, let the mechalale Shabbos do it, right? We got to figure out. So he commissioned different Talmudei Chachamim to kind of investigate specific areas and write halachic essays with practical recommendations, lemaisa, that you could run a state in accordance with halacha in that, in that way. Uh, it never got finished, and uh, the little bit that was done is a little obsolete because it dates back to the 1950s, but one rabbi who did uh, do a lot of writing on this was Rabbi Eliezer Waldenberg, the uh, of Levrach, who died just a few years ago. He's the, known as the Tzitz Eliezer. And the Tzitz Eliezer is like many, many volumes of Shailas and Shuvas. But in addition to the Tzitz Eliezer, he wrote another book called Hilchos Medina, the halachos of running a state, in which he went through all of these different questions. And that sefer had not been reprinted for many, many, many years. It was like printed in the 50s. And he was putting out chalik after chalik of Tzitz Eliezer, Shailas Tzitzubas, but the Hilchas Medina never got printed because people were against it, uh, kind of, you know, you're not supposed to be involved in politics. Uh, recently, a few years ago, they did reprint Hilchas Medina, and it really is a classic work, but again, as I say, uh, it's, a, it's, it's a little out of date in terms of the practicalities of it, because it is a book from the 1950s. So Rav Herzog did have this grand vision of making Eretz Yisrael, not a theocracy, but uh, to create institutions that could carry out the functions of statehood within uh, fe fealty to, to halacha. Uh, but he himself did recognize that uh, religious coercion would not be proper and we have to regard a government as legitimate even if uh, the particular people were not religious. Yeah. This question was sent in. Uh, <clears throat> recently documents were leaked that the U.S. Supreme Court is looking to overturn Roe yeah, that's, that's, Roe that's, v. Wade. Right. Being that the halachos on abortion aren't black and white, what should our standpoint be on these laws? Is it better for abortion to be legal from a federal level for the times that it would be mutter? Or is it better to allow the possibility to ban it, especially with the left pushing for late-term abortions? Right, so that, that's a very interesting question. I will tell you that uh, as, a, as a former law student, the, for me, the most interesting part of this is not the Supreme Court decision, but that a leak took place in the Supreme Court. This has literally never happened in uh, more than 200 years, 250 years in the United States, that a whole draft opinion, mamish, a whole draft opinion gets leaked. How did that happen? I mean, this is like a wall of iron, a mechitza shelbarza, that there is never a leak. Who did it? And there's a lot of speculation. Some say a liberal judge or a liberal clerk did it to embarrass the conservatives. Some say the conservatives did it because that way uh, nobody could change their mind, right? Because what's going to be, because it's a 5-4 decision. Uh, but you know, I know John Roberts always tries to make pshares, so I'm sure he was going to try to do it. So by solidifying the five people who voted for it, they can't change their mind now because people, people are going to say, oh, you changed your mind because of pressure. Right? All right, so it's an interesting machlokas in the gossip. Is it liberal or conservative? Okay, but that's more of the uh, gossip issues and again, very, very interesting because this has never happened before. It's quite amazing. But in terms of the laws of abortions, let's go over Bikitzer. What does halacha say about abortion? So uh, the halacha is not as complicated as you might assume. Uh, the basic rule is abortion is prohibited <coughs> unless the mother's life is in danger. That is a bottom line. Now, uh, this is true not only for Jewish people who are governed by the 613 commandments of the Torah. This is even true for non-Jews who are only governed by the seven commandments of Noah. But the Gemara in Sanhedrin says Beferish, that the killing of a fetus is prohibited not only under the laws of Klal Yisrael, but under the laws of B'nai Noach. Now, there's a lot of discussion here because when we say you can abort a baby or a fetus if the mother's life is in danger, a danger can include a lot of things. Danger can include psychological stress as well as physical danger. Let's take, for example, rape and incest, right? Sometimes you'll have a pro-life person that says something like, I'm against abortion except in cases 
of rape or incest. Now, in some ways, that's illogical. Because if I'm against abortion because I believe life begins at conception, then what gives me the right to kill the fetus because it's rape or incest? Could I kill a baby that was born from rape, rape or incest? Certainly not. So why could I kill a fetus that was born from rape or incest? So what would halacha say about rape or incest? Halacha would say this. There is no such thing as a rape or incest exception. There is only a pikuach nefesh exception. But halacha recognizes that the trauma of forcing a woman to carry a baby that is in her body as a result of rape or incest might be so immense that it might qualify as a suicidal event. Now that would depend on the person. So we don't say there's a rape or incest exception, but we understand that depending on the circumstances, there may be pikuach nefesh. There's also a discussion that since the Gemara says a fetus until it is 40 days old is mere water, so some would permit a very, very early abortion. It's not even called an abortion medically, within 40 days of conception. Right, so basically abortion is forbidden unless mother's life is in danger, but danger to mother's life can be assessed psychologically as well as medically. And we have situations of early, very, very early term abortion within 40 days, right? That's kind of the overall structure. Now, let's now apply, now this is where you get into a bridge that could break on you or a thin ice bridge or whatever the appropriate metaphor is. How do these halachic values translate into what my political position should be in a secular government? Now, the easiest thing to say, which might be correct, I don't mean to say that it's wrong, but the easiest thing to say would be, I would like abortion laws to reflect the values I have as a Torah Jew. And if I, as a Torah Jew, believe abortion is wrong, unless the mother's life is in danger, and I believe that that is true for Noahides, for Goyim, as well as Jews, then I will be in favor of a restrictive abortion law that says no abortion unless the mother's life is in danger, and therefore I would be in favor of Justice Alito's draft opinion uh, overruling Roe versus Wade. By the way, you do understand, I mean, I don't, I don't want to get into the legalities here. Uh, overruling Roe versus Wade doesn't make abortion forbidden. I mean, you understand the way that works. Roe versus Wade created a constitutional right to an abortion that no state can take away. Roe versus Wade, I'm sorry, overruling Roe versus Wade takes away the constitutional right. It is then up to every individual state to pass their own abortion laws. Rest assured, for example, <laughs> that even if Roe versus Wade gets uh, reversed, you will still be able to get an abortion in California uh, because they'll pass their own law that's going to permit. You, you understand that Roe versus Wade simply means instead of creating a federal right, it will go to every individual state. Okay, but be it as it may, Texas and the like, you know, the southern states are going to pass anti-abortion laws, and my initial reaction would be, Gesundheit, hate, that's a wonderful news. We need a law that follows uh, not Jewish values, but the values that Hashem wants even for non-Jews. So that's the Pashat Pshat. That is the Pashat Pshat. However, there is another side to this. And I'll just throw it out for you to think about it. I'm not advocating it. And that is, even if I believe that abortion is wrong and abortion is evil and abortion should be usher, I may not want a secular government to pass a law to that effect. Because once it is a secular law, it will be interpreted in a secular way, which may actually take away halachic rights that would otherwise exist. Let me give you an example. Halacha says abortion is only permitted if the mother's life is in danger. Let's imagine the state of Mississippi would pass a law that says the same thing. Abortion is permitted only when the mother's life is in danger. So I might celebrate that and say, Baruch Hashem, the state of Mississippi, Paskins like the Rambam. <laughs> well, let's imagine you have a woman that was raped. And the Rav Paskins, that because of the fragility of her condition, this is a matter of life and death and an abortion is allowed. But the state attorney general, or the state's attorney of whatever county in Mississippi, 
thinks it wasn't life-threatening. She could go to jail. In other words, by making it a secular law, the interpretation of that law will no longer be halakhically based or religiously based. It's going to be secularly based. So one could make the argument, this is a, you know, a kind of a subtle argument, that even if I am religiously pro-life, anti-abortion, I would rather have the government not get involved. And that way, my freedom of religion to follow halakha is preserved, as opposed to if the government gets involved, my freedom of religion gets abridged. So the net result of all of this is that your halakhic position does not automatically dictate your political position. But that's a bit of a subtlety, and many people will say that's wrong, but it is something to, to think about. Uh, yeah. languages, astronomy, astrology, mathematics. And after Halakha has developed so much and so much more specific, you can spend your whole life really just studying one area of Halakha. So for one that's seeking wisdom, like wi the wisdom that satisfies the heart and the mind, is it preferable to go so deep into you know, the Arbiturim and the commentaries or to go into learn Greek and Latin and, and how astronomy works and you know like that's how the great early rabbis are described. Right, 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 right. Well, uh, it's a very, very good question. I mean, obviously, the great early rabbis were so much greater than us that they could do everything. The Vilna Gaon mastered thank you, mastered many, many secular chachmot and still was, became the Vilna Gaon. Most of us have to make a choice. To make a choice, Torah is going to be more important. But there is um, a quotation from the Vilna Gaon, uh, and some people claim it's a forgery, so they're going to tell you it's not authentic, but Rav Chaim Friedlander said it was authentic, that for every measure of secular wisdom that a person does not have, that's, there's 10 times the amount of Torah he doesn't understand. Meaning if you don't understand mathematics and astronomy, there will be huge sections of Torah that you're not really going to get. So it is important to try to uh, get at least the basics of these chachmas. I mean, after all, the laws of Kiddush HaChodesh, sanctifying the new moon, depend on astronomy. You look at the Rambam, look at Hilchas Kiddush HaChodesh. The Rambam gives you astronomical calculations based on angles, trigonometry. <coughs> Even Rav Chaim Kineski, Rav Chaim Kineski had no secular education in school, but you'll see in his Sfarim, you'll see diagrams with sine, cosine, the equivalents of trigonometry. I mean, he didn't use the, the words, but the concepts uh, were developed and were, uh, were understood. In fact, the Vilna Gaon commissioned the translation of Euclid's geometry into Hebrew, called Ayo Meshulash. It's Euclid. It's literally a translation into Hebrew, and the Vilna Gaon treasured that book, and he considered it to be uh, very, very important. So I think it is true that a knowledge of Chachmos can be very, very useful. And that was the tradition, certainly among, the, uh, among many of the Rishonim, and uh, even among the Achronim, uh, up to the Vilna Gaon, and to some degree even after the Vilna Gaon. So the question really becomes a question of, of, number one, time, and a question of, number two, talent and interest. Meaning to say, uh, if we're not on the Madrega to know everything, and we have to pick and choose, so maybe regretfully so, but you would have to put your emphasis more on Torah knowledge than those other areas. Uh, you also have to differentiate between different types of branches of knowledge. Uh, you'll notice that when the Rambam, when the Vilna Gaon, uh, when they talk about secular wisdom, they refer to what you might call the hard sciences. They'll, they'll refer to things like math, astronomy, uh, physics, things like that. Uh, when you get into things like psychology, philosophy, literature, there you actually see sometimes the opposite idea, that since these are not objective realities, these are just referring to different ways you view the world, one's Weltanschauung, one's worldview, should come from Torah and should not come, so it's come from secular sources. So you will see that even those who advocate expanding your curriculum to embrace secular sources, they do differentiate between hard science and the social sciences, the humanities, and the like. 
On the other end, there's always another hand. I have three hands already. Uh, you have someone like Rav Aaron Lichtenstein. Rav Aaron Lichtenstein was Rav Yosef Dov Soloveitchik's son-in-law. He was a Rosh Hashiva in his own right, a great Rosh Hashiva in his own right. And he died a few years ago. And uh, he also had a PhD in English literature from Harvard University. And although when he was a Rosh Hashiva, he was a Rosh Hashiva. He didn't like bring in uh, all these things. But Rav Lichtenstein said that even from humanities, there are insights into life and understanding that can enrich our service of God. So he was not necessarily willing to consign all humanities to the dust heap. He was willing to say that there is insight in Shakespeare and Milton and, and the like that one could use. I think Rav Hirsch had the same shita because uh, you know, Rav Hirsch created in Germany the movement called Torim Derech Eretz, which was integrating secular culture and Torah, which was very different than the Polish, Russian, Lithuanian model of separatism. And I believe in Rav Hirsch's school, he created a school, a, a day school, a, an elementary school, and a high school and a yeshiva, but I believe in the elementary and high school, uh, they celebrated the, um, the birthday of Schiller, not, not, not to be confused with our Rav Schiller, but uh, Schiller was a very, very famous German poet, uh, kind of he and Goethe were the two greatest German poets, and Rav Hirsch felt that that was a day worthy of celebration uh, within his yeshiva. So, like many, many things, there are different opinions, different views, and I think it's not a one-size-fit-all. I think many, many people will, can benefit a lot from exposure to these ideas. For other people, it may hurt them in their faith in God. So uh, the same things that can be very beneficial to one person can be poison to another person. And that's why these decisions are very, very difficult to articulate on a general level. Yeah. So um, once Mashiach comes and Tchazabetim happens for the people who passed away, what happens to the people who are alive when Mashiach comes? Do they change to a different like, uh, physical being? Yeah, yeah, that's an excellent question. Uh, eventually, there's going to be resurrection of the dead, and that's going to be sometime after Mashiach. Now, we don't know if it'll be a year after Mashiach or 10,000 years after Mashiach, meaning until Tachiyas HaMesim, people are still going to die. Mashiach is going to die. Mashiach is going to be succeeded by son of Mashiach. In other words, Mashiach is going to establish a hereditary dynastic succession, like David HaMelech and Shlomo, so there might be a hundred uh, Mashiachs, so to speak, until Tichiyas HaMesim. But at some point, unknown point, Tichiyas HaMesim is going to come. And those who are Zohar from Tichiyas HaMesim, their soul will be reunited in their body. But the question is, what if you happen to be alive? You just happen to be alive. You're a kid who was born uh, the day before Tchiyas HaMesim, right? But you were born. You didn't, you didn't have to be resurrected. You just happened to be there. So it's kind of strange. What exactly is it? So my next door neighbor is going to live forever, but I'm going to die. And then what? They'll come back later? Like, you know, uh, so one way of understanding it is once there's Tchiyas HaMesim, so just like the people who were dead come back for eternal life, the people who are alive are now given eternal life, meaning to say everybody who is Zohar to, to arise is given eternal life. Some people are coming back from the dead. Some people never died. They, they didn't go through a death experience because they happen to be alive when Tchiyas HaMesim comes. So that's one possibility, meaning the resurrection will take place by not dying as opposed to dying and coming back. But the morale is mashma, not the way. The morale is mashma a little bit that those people who happen to be alive, they still have to go through a death experience. That somehow it is essential for ultimate redemption that you go through a death and then God brings you back to life. So that would mean that would be a round two of Tchiyas HaMesa, meaning to say the first round will cover all of history. And the second round will cover all the people that uh, were uh, alive at the time of Tchiyas HaMesim, that they're going to have to die at some point. Now maybe, a lot of questions, maybe God will kill them right away and bring them back right away. So there won't be a time lag. Or maybe they'll live a normal life expectancy and be taken away and then come back. You know, I honestly don't know. Uh, but there apparently is a machlokas if those people will have to undergo death 
or they will just automatically be given eternal, eternal life. Uh, yeah, in the back of the verse. Yeah. Um, um, the kids should have a widely available in English. And it's a very useful book because it summarizes the uh, Zalotas and Minhagin. Um, but as an example, it gives a list of when one should wash one's hands. It gives certain circumstances. For example, if you touch your head. But then you learn further that it's not simply you touch your hair, you wash your hands. There has to be a modicum of sweat, etc. So if you're just reading the short kind of look at face value, it doesn't always literally assist you, otherwise you're washing your hands all the time. How would you advise one approaches the short kind of look? And are there any other books that might help in this regard? Yeah, this is actually a very excellent question. Now, the Kitzur Shulchan Aruch, the abbreviated Shulchan Aruch, was written by a great, great rabbi in the 1800s, Rabbi Shlomo Gansfried, who was a Hungarian rabbi. And he was a big, big Talmud Chacham, a big posek. And uh, the Kitzur Shulchan Aruch is quite uh, an amazing and impressive book. Uh, but the decisions of the Kitzur are not always followed. For example, the Mishnah Brura. Uh, which was written later, may not follow the Kitzer, the Aruch HaSholchan may not follow, etc. Uh, the Minhagen may not be like the Kitzer. Um, the stringencies of Hungarian Jewry were not necessarily the same in Poland and Germany and America and England and the like. So for a lot of things, the Kitzer is not at all a definitive source of halacha. So what you need is, you need an addition of the Kitzer that updates it with contemporary psukim. So my best recommendation is Art Scroll. Once again, Art Scroll comes to the rescue. Uh, once again, uh, they put out a, a Kitzer Shulchan Aruch in English, which will give you the annotations from the Mishnah Brura, from Rav Moshe Feinstein, from the Chazonish, and the like, and will a actually tell you when is standard Orthodox practice like the Kitzer, and when is it not. It's really essential, because without that type of guidebook, uh, you really will not know, because although the Kitzer is indeed a very, very fine safer, and Rav Gansfried was a very chash of a Talmud Chacham, but Lamaisa, it is, it is indisputable that we do not always follow his Piskei Halacha. So my recommendation is get, get the Arts Grove Kitzer, and you're going to be okay. Yeah. What is the power in a kli? Why do we have to use a kli to wash our hands or to drink out of or many other, you know, halachas or otherwise? What, what is in yeah. a kli? That's a very, that is a very good question. A kli, idea of utensil, is a very important aspect of halacha. So, for example, uh, washing your hands before bread. Uh, the water must be poured from a kli. You can't just, uh, unless, unless or, or, well, if you have a mikvah, you can put your hands in a mikvah. That, that's true. But short of a mikvah, if I simply dip my hands in the sink in a basin, that is not valid. There has to be the pouring. It has to be from a clay and all sorts of shilas. Is plastic considered a clay? If there's a hole in it, it's no good, right, etc. Because it has to be a clay. And the question becomes, uh, what is so spiritually significant about the idea of something being a a clay? Like, who cares? I mean, as long as it's water, right? It's water clean. So, uh, what's the difference? Mm where the water comes from. Um, you know, I don't have a complete answer to that. Uh, the, the, the one thing that I think about is this. A kli represents a uh, kind of man's creative mastery over raw material. That I take a raw material and I fashion it in some way. Whether it be metal, whether it be wood, whether it be plastic. I made it from something that was not directly usable to something that was usable. Maybe the lesson is, at least when we talk about uh, sitting down and eating, uh, what I'm doing is I'm saying that even those things that I've created through my ingenuity and my skill, I acknowledge that it is from God that I was given that ability. And therefore, I take it and I use it to consecrate myself to Hashem. As if to say, I do not regard myself as an autonomous agent in the creation. I regard myself as a servant of God, and I do so by taking the things that I've created, or some company created, by its own ingenuity, and consecrating it, and using it. But uh, it is, ultimately, it's still a good question. Uh, somebody asked me this question. I, th I think it's obvious, but it's a little chiddish. Uh, there are two ways you can do natilat yadayim. One way is you pour water from a kli onto your hands. 
The other way is you can dip your hands in a mikvah. You dip your hands in a mikvah, and that's Natila Chadaim, if it's a kosher mikvah. So somebody said, is it only if you dip your hands? What if, what if I go to the mikvah? Does that mean I go to the mikvah, I can eat bread without, uh, without washing my hands? Because I went to the mikvah. Now, it seems logical, I think, although I couldn't find it beferish, that, hey, uh, if dipping my hands is good, then when I'm in a mikvah, I am in my hands are in the mikvah. The only thing is that, generally speaking, when you get dressed, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll tend to touch areas that are normally covered, so you'd have to wash again for that reason. But assuming that, you know, you wouldn't do that, theoretically, uh, one could go to the mikvah, and then eat bread without, uh, without having to do tila yadayim because that would be nichlal in tevilas yadayim. Because I, I didn't see any principle that it has to only be your hands and not, not the rest of your body. So that's an interesting horror to be aware of. Yeah. Uh, going back on uh, the discussion, um, so uh, not, um, the whole discussion about Zionism and everything, that's like more, I guess, in a more idealistic way. Now I guess like Lamai said, like post facto that we have a Jewish common state. Um, what, is, what is so controversial about seeing um, the, this, I guess, the fact that there's, there is so much Torah and there's so much settlement, Jewish settlement in Seleuza? What is so controversial about seeing it as, as a Chava de Gula? Yeah. What, what should be our response to that? I mean, what are we supposed to do about that like, post fact that that's already done? Yeah, so, so this, this is really, I think, very much illustrated by Chabad itself. I had mentioned that the Rebbe Rashab, that's Rav Shalom Ber Schneerson, who died in the 1920s, uh, actually wrote that it was forbidden uh, to have a Jewish state until Moshiach comes, and that's called the rebellion against Hashem, right? Uh, very much like the Naturi Karta position. Now, we know that Rav Menachem Mendel Schneerson, the last Lubavitcher Rebbe, was a very big supporter of the state of Israel, of the army. He was against giving any territories back. He was absolutely adamant against it. So how do you explain it? I mean, is he just repudiating uh, what his great-grandfather, uh, uh, not, uh, not his grandfather, whatever, his, uh, his relative or predecessor Rebbe said? So I think the, the understanding is it's exactly along the lines that you're suggesting. The Rebbe didn't say it so much, but I, I would... Take the, have the nerve to say that perhaps it would have been better had there not been a state of Israel. But once there is a state of Israel, and once you have millions and millions of Jews living here, we have a sacred responsibility not to endanger their lives and to allow for the building of Torah and Ruchnius to the greatest degree. You might call this, I could even coin a term, you might call this pragmatic rather than ideological Zionism. It's not ideological in the sense that Baruch Hashem, we have a state, we're independent. But it's an after-the-fact type of recognition that, hey, we're all here. We got to do the best that we can. So that's not the same as Aschalta de Gaula, but that's simply saying whenever you have a lot of Jews in any one place, you got to try to create the environment that's best for them. So I think that's very true. Now, they tell a story. I love this story, and I really, really uh, hope it's true. I'm told it's not true. So don't send me emails that the story is not true. <laughs> I know that. But I'm going to tell you the story because it does illustrate something. And I really, I actually do hope it's true. But again, uh, a lot of evidence says it's not actually true. Uh, those of you that remember American history, you, you may remember uh, Richard Nixon. And uh, you may remember that uh, the candidate that ran against him in 1968 was Lyndon Johnson's vice president, Hubert Humphrey. Hubert Humphrey was a liberal from Minnesota. He was a Zionist way before 1948. He was a big supporter of the state of Israel. Uh, in those days, Democrats used to support Israel, not like, not like today. Uh, and so he was told when he was running against Nixon that there's a large group of Jews in Williamsburg that come out in mass to vote, so he ought to go there. These are Satmar Hasidim. So, he goes to Williamsburg, and he has, a, he has an interpreter to speak in Yiddish. And he gives a speech about, I support the Zionist state, Zionism, and my life has been de devoted to Zionism uh, for you know, five decades. And there's no Zionist as strong as I am. 
And he was a little <laughs> concerned because these Hasidim are hearing all of these words, you know, but they know Zionism is Tuma, and they're, they're, not like, they're not like getting excited. So uh, one of his Jewish aides realizes something's wrong, and then he figured out what it was, that this is not the crowd that you talk to about Zionism. So he goes over to the Satmar Rebbe, and he says... You know, please, please forgive. You know, Humphrey has good intentions. He just was ignorant about the Rebbe's shitos and everything else. And the Satmar Rebbe was smiling. And the Satmar Rebbe said, listen, here's the thing. I'm against the state of Israel. There shouldn't be a state of Israel. I hope for the peaceful dismantlement of the state of Israel. I'm against it. But as long as there are Jews, I don't want a single Jew's life to be in danger. So if we have to give weapons to the Israeli army so that Jewish lives don't get killed, I want those weapons to go. So I support everything. I, I want the state to be dismantled, but I support every single military aid that you're giving because I don't want any, any soldier to be hurt. Uh, it's a beautiful story because basically it says, yeah, I'm against the state. I'm not against the Jews. I want the Jews to be protected. They tell another story with the Satmar Rebbe, which is even, maybe even better. The Satmar Rebbe, there was once like somebody who gave a talk about uh, Israel, you know, want to be dismantled, etc. So somebody said to the Satmar Rebbe, here, here you, have, you have this politician just like you. He says like this, he says, listen, I'm against the state because I know this Gemara, that Gemara, these Rishonim, these Achreinim. This guy doesn't know any of that. Why is he against the state? He's just an anti-Semite. He says, <laughs> so, so what's, my, what's my connection to him? He says, I have Machiris, I have reasons, I have Lumbus. He has no Lumbus, so he's against it. <laughs> he just hates Jews, right? So there's a difference there, a difference there as well. He was very sharp. Satmar Rebbe was a brilliant Talmud Chacham and very, very sharp, very, very uh, uh, astute, yeah. Um. During the time of the Sanhedrin, what was the penalty for someone who uh, performed an illegal abortion? Yeah, so this is very interesting. This is a very curious dichotomy between the Noahide Code and the Torah laws. The Noahide Code is what pertains to Gentiles, and the Torah law is what applies to the Jewish people. And paradoxically, the Noahide law is stricter. Under the laws of the Seven Commandments of Noah, if a Ben Noach performs an abortion that was not permitted, it is a capital offense for which he could get the death penalty. If a Jew performs an abortion that is not permitted, it is a prohibited offense, but it is not a capital offense. And in fact, there is no designated punishment other than financial liability. Uh, and that would depend if, if, uh, on whether the father agreed to the abortion. Now, there's, there's a general rule in the Torah that if you, you kill the fetus, you have to pay the father the damage. But if the father consented to the abortion, that, that wouldn't be the case, right? So that would depend. So it's a little strange that the laws of abortion are stricter for non-Jews than they are for Jews. And that throws into a wrench conceptually. I don't want to get into too much because this is a, a whole, whole sheer. The Torah does not allow abortion. Okay, granted. But what's the halachic theory. Is abortion murder? Is that why it's forbidden? Or is abortion something else? W whatever else that would be. Now here's the argument. If abortion would be murder, then it ought to be a capital crime like murder. The very fact that it's not a capital crime indicates that a fetus is actually not a person but it is a potentiality of a person. And the Torah says you have to respect the potentiality that it could become, but it's not murder. And that explains another anomaly that I don't know if you were thinking about this. I had mentioned that the one halachic permissibility of abortion that is indisputed or undisputed is you can abort a fetus if the mother's life is in danger. Now, Think about that. That actually doesn't make sense because the halacha generally is you're not allowed to kill one life to save another life. So why would, why, why would I be allowed to kill the fetus? If I'm a doctor, kill the fetus to save the mother. Isn't that the rule that you don't kill one person to save another? In other words, what is the halachic logic 
that you can, that the mother's life has precedence over the fetus's life. Rashi says, Rashi says, because the fetus is not really a life. The fetus is only a potential. So although you can't kill an actual life to save an actual life, you can terminate a potential life to save an actual life. Now that's what Rashi says. Rambam gives another reason. Rambam says that the conceptual basis for killing the, killing the fetus to save the mother is if the fetus is the source of the endangerment, the fetus is a rodef. The fetus is like threatening the mother's life, although it's an involuntary rodef. So those are two different rationales. But at least according to Rashi, you clearly see that abortion is not the same as murder. And that is why it is not a capital crime. Okay, so uh, that much is, yeah. Um, in terms of uh, Kedishim and Tefillah, I was wondering if the Rav could explain like the purposes and differences of the different uh, Kedishim and then where they're placed and why. In the, in like yeah. The prayers of the day, yeah. Along with the like the signif the significance of like the amount per type of kaddish, right. And then, um, and then lastly, when we can or should respond to them if we're like not with the the speed of the seaboard and we're behind and we're saying something else, like right. that along with Boruch and other responses. To yeah, yeah. <laughs> there's, yeah. There's, 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 there's a lot of questions in, in that. Uh, let me just make one, one uh, simple point first. That is, Kaddish, people associate with the mourner's Kaddish, the Kaddish over the dead and the like. Kaddish has nothing to do with dead people. Uh, Kaddish appears many, many times in davening in many, many different forms. Uh, and essentially, Kaddish marks the conclusion of a service as a period at the end of a sentence, or sometimes a semicolon that divides different parts of a service. So, the Chatsi Kaddish is a semicolon, and the Kaddish Sholem is a period. By that I mean, when you're making a break between Psuke de Zimra and the Brachos of Shema, but you're still davening Shachris, so the way we signify that break is with what's called the Chatsi Kaddish. Right? That's the break. Similarly, when we finish the Torah reading, but we're going to continue with Ashrei and the like, we have Chatsi Kaddish. So Chasi Kaddish is when you're dividing different uh, parts of the service, and the purpose is to kind of sanctify God's name. We finish the activity, let's sanctify God's name with the HMA Rabbi. Kaddish Shalem is at the conclusion of a service, Shachris, Mincha, Mairus. That is, uh, Shachris after, well again, Shachris is officially over after Uval Etzion. So we say Kaddish Shalem after Uval Etzion. And uh, the, the main characteristic of Kaddish Shalem is the addition of the phrase, Tiskabel Solosan Uvausan Dechol Beis Yisrael. Accept the prayers of Israel. That's the conclusion of Shachris, the conclusion of Mincha after Tachanun, and the conclusion of Mairiv after the Amid. Now you'll notice, interestingly enough, that the Kaddish Shalem is positioned differently for Shachris, Mincha, and Mairiv. The Kaddish Shalem of Shachris is after Uval Etzion. The Kaddish Shalem of Mincha is after Tachanun. The Kaddish Shalem of Mairiv is after Shmon Esri. Now, obviously, in Mairiv, you don't have Tachanun and you don't have Uval Etzion, so that's why you do it there. But the one thing you'll notice in all three is that the Kadesh Shalem is recited before Oleinu. After Oleinu, we often recite the mourner's Kadesh, which is a full Kadesh minus the sentence Tiskabel. So the truth of the matter is, Oleinu is not really part of the service. Oleinu was added later. It's a very important prayer. It is a very important prayer. Uh, but it is not really a chalik of Shachris, Mincha, Mairev, and that's why the Kadesh Shalem is before that point. So if the Chatsi Kaddish is designed to split different parts of a service, Kaddish Tiskabel, which is called Kaddish Sholem, is designed to end a service by asking Hashem to accept our prayers. Now, if you forgot to say Kaddish Sholem after Uval Etzion, then you will say Kaddish Sholem after Aleinu and even after the Yom, uh, whatever, whatever it would be. 
Now, Kaddish to Rabbanan is a Kaddish, now this is a little bit of a problem, that theoretically is supposed to be recited every time you finish your Torah learning, at least if it's Agada or the like. Now that would mean, you know, why don't, why don't we say a Kaddish to Rabbanan after every morning Seder, or after every afternoon Seder? Uh, I don't know. I don't really have the answer so much. Uh, because the Kaddish is for learning, but we only use it at certain times, primarily for mourners to give them an extra uh, Kaddish. But theoretically, it can be used all of the time. Uh, what is the most important part of Kaddish? There is no question whatsoever that the, the line, Yehei Shmei Rabba Mevarach Li'olam Olomei Omaya May God's name be blessed, may his great name be blessed forever and ever, is the most important line of Kaddish. Chazal say, anyone that answers Yehei Shmei Rabbah with all of his strength, which means all of his kavana, then even if, God forbid, there's an evil decree that's been on the books for 70 years, Hashem rips it up. Yehei Shmei Rabbah Mevarach. I think I mentioned before that um, I remember the very first time uh, I visited uh, a yeshiva. I was like in sixth grade, and uh, Rabbi Rosenbaum, who actually comes to here now, uh, kind of took the boys, took the kids to uh, visit a yeshiva, visit Nair Yisrael, which is kind of why I went to Nair Yisrael. And uh, the first time I heard Yehesh Me Rabbi in a yeshiva based medrash was so different than what I remembered in Young Israel or whatever it would be, that people were literally saying it out loud with a lot of enthusiasm. It made a great impression. Now, you, know, you get used to it after a while, so I can't say I, I still have that same impression as I had more than 50 years ago. Uh, but Yehei Shmei Rabba is a very, very important point. So as a result, going back to your last question about interruptions, I mean, check the article, sitter, there are a lot of details, but generally, uh, when it comes to answering Kaddish, the two things that you need to be meticulous on is Yehei Shmei Rabba, uh, Mavarach, and at the end of Li'ela min kol b'chasa b'shiraza tish b'chasa b'nechemasa the end of what will be chasi kaddish even in a kaddish shalem that last domain is important so those two you will, you will actually answer almost everywhere you are even in the middle of Shema at least if you're at the end of a Pasuk uh, everything else you will often not answer if you're in a place that you're not allowed to interrupt okay so kaddish does have those two most important parts uh, the rest is important, but not of the same chashivas. Same if you're like in the middle of Tehillim, like there are de Zimra. Or there oh, no, no. So, so, there, so there are many differences. So, so, so for Pesuke de Zimra, you answer virtually everything in Kaddish. Oh. In Birchas Kriya Shema, you only an, and Shema, you only answer Yehesh Me Rabbah and the, the Amen after the Elam and Kol Birchas HaVashivasa. Uh, if you happen to be between Goal Yisrael and Shmon Ezra, you answer nothing. And in Shmon Ezra, you answer nothing. Uh, in Shmon Ezra, there is nothing that you answer. The only exception would be Kedusha. If, 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 if you are up to Kedusha, up to Kedusha, when the Chazan is up to Kedusha, you say Kedusha with the Chazan. But if you're not up to the Kedusha or you're after Kedusha, you simply uh, be silent. You remain silent have kavana to be yotze uh, with the chazan, but you do not say anything. In the Amida, you say nothing at all. Uh, the only exception would be if you're up to Kedusha, or if you're the chazan, when the Kohanim are duchening, you say Amen after the three psukim. Uh, the chazan says Amen, uh, but you do not say Amen to the bracha, Asher Kedushanu, the mitzvah of Kedushanu, and the like. So, why is the mitzvah of uh, having kids? For men, and why is the curse of childbearing on Chalom? Yeah. So uh, the mitzvah of Peru is a very strange mitzvah. There's a mitzvah to have children, or at least try to have children, but the mitzvah is only on a man. The mitzvah is not on a woman. Now, obviously, a man cannot have kids by himself, so he has to find a woman who wants to have kids. But the woman is not high up to have kids. Why is that so? So uh, there are two reasons, and they, they move in opposite directions, actually. Well, 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 the first reason is how do you know that? You know that because the Torah describes pru or vu as conquering. Pru or vu, be fruitful, multiply, miluus aretz, fill the land, the kivshuha, and conquer it. So having kids is called conquest. 
Anyone that's a parent understands. You know, you got to conquer this hostile force there. And since con uh, conquest is a male activity, not a female, that's how we exclude women because a woman is not involved in conquest. Now that's the derivation. What's the logic? So there are two opposite svaras that are given. Svara number one is that since childbirth is a sakana, pregnancy and childbirth endanger the life of a woman. So Hashem is never going to command you to do something that endangers your life. Hashem can command me as a man to find a woman who willingly wants to endanger her life. But Hashem is not going to command a woman, you must put your life in danger. That is what the Meshachachma says. Others give an opposite reason, and they say that the maternal yearning of a woman for a child is stronger than a, again, these are generalizations, but is generally stronger than the yearning of a man to have children. Part of it might be a man has indefinite time. A man can have a child at 90. A woman has a biological clock. So there's a greater sense of urgency. So based on that difference, the maternal instinct is stronger. The Torah did not give a mitzvah to a woman because that is something she would naturally gravitate to do anyway. So she doesn't need the push of a mitzvah. A man who might think, I'll just take my time, Hashem says, no, you got to get to it as soon as you're able to do it. Right? So that would be a difference of the maternal instinct. Now, the Meshachach gives a third reason, which is very, very fascinating. Listen to this reason. We know, according to Halacha, before Rabbeinu Gershom's enactment, a man could have two wives, but a woman can only have one husband. So, if a man marries a woman, and a woman cannot have children, he doesn't have to divorce his wife, he can just take another wife. So putting the mitzvah on the man does not destroy a marriage. But if we put a mitzvah on a woman, and let's say a woman marries a man who can't have kids, but she could have kids, since a woman does not have the option of another husband, the only alternative available to her would be to get a divorce. The Torah does not want to situate the mitzvah in such a way that it would compel the breakup of a marriage. By putting pru or vu on the man, it is not necessitating a breakup of a marriage. By putting it on the woman, it would have necessitated the breakup of a marriage. Do you understand the idea? Because uh, if I, as a man, marry a woman who can't have children, I don't have to divorce my wife, but I'll fulfill pru or vu by another wife. But if a woman married a man who cannot have children, if she would have a chiv, she would be forced to leave her husband. And the Torah doesn't want to make that type of decision. And the Meshachach applies the Pasuk, Jirachaha Darchei Noam, the Torah's ways are ways of pleasantness. Now the truth is, this is a beautiful, ingenious explanation. But Lamaisa, it practically, it, it, it's no longer true, because under the ban of Rabbeinu Gershom, a Ashkenazi man is not allowed to have two uh, wives. And that would actually mean, therefore, that if a man married a woman who could not have children, he might be obligated uh, to divorce his wife. So unfortunately, we're bedafka in a system that would not have been optimal. But Lamaisa, la halacha, we are making on that. La halacha, the Ramah says that Pizman uh, although Medina de Gemara, uh, a get might have been required, we do not compel husbands to divorce wives because the wives are not able to have uh, children. Yeah. It reminds me of Shiva um, learning and they do Yeah, th that's an interesting point. Uh, we had uh, the siren uh, last night and today in honor of or in memory of the uh, soldiers who had fallen in defense of Medinat Yisrael and Am Yisrael. Uh, and then last week, uh, at the end of Nisan, we had Yom HaShoah, Holocaust Memorial Day, where they also had a siren and the light. And the custom in Israel is that everybody stops what they're doing. It's like those uh, movies where time freezes, you know, uh, even the bus. I, I happened to be on a bus last night when the siren and the bus just stopped in the middle of uh, middle of traffic and the like. People get out of their cars, uh, everything like that. Uh, so, number one, I did make the point, which is obvious, but I'll say it again, 
If you are outside and you are being seen by other people, you absolutely, positively must stop. If you do not stop, it is a chilo Hashem. That is, to me, push it. Okay. But the question is, let's say I'm not outside. I'm in my office. I'm in the base medrash. I'm in the middle of a shear. There's no non-religious people that are watching me or photographing me or the like. Am I intrinsically supposed to stop what I'm doing uh, to stand up? So uh, the truth is, uh, you're not mechayif. Now, I would differentiate. It depends what you're doing. If you're learning Torah, uh, you're in a shir, or you're even at a seder, I would say there's no reason to stop, other than chilul Hashem, and if nobody's watching you, they're, they're, I don't think it's a chilul Hashem. If, on the other hand, you know, uh, I don't know, you're watching TV, or you're eating a falafel, whatever it is, then I think uh, maybe remembering the fallen soldiers uh, might be more important than finishing that falafel or the like. Now, I would say that if you're learning and not getting up, uh, you can have a thought in your mind that may this learning be an elevation for the neshamas. And that'll be just as good as standing up. You know, there are people who wrote shuvas that the whole idea of standing up, moment of silence, is really chukos agoyim. That, that was not the Jewish way of mourning. That is not a mourning ritual, etc. So they, so they actually tell people not to do it. But once again, if it's in public, you've got to take in, into account chilul Hashem. You know, Israel, even though, Baruch Hashem, we've grown a lot, Israel is still a small country. And almost everybody knows somebody who knows somebody, maybe three degrees, that lost someone in one of the wars or through terrorism, uh, whether it's a parent or whether it's a child or whether it's a sibling or whether it's a friend. So it's important that uh, besides the Hakara Satov, uh, not to step on people's memories, not to kind of behave as if it doesn't matter that somebody died in the defense of, of Eretz Israel. But I, I don't see a chiyav, per se, um, of standing up in the middle of a shir if there's no chilul Hashem. Yeah? Um, so there's um, the idea that you're supposed to stand up for elders and the like, like down the age, age, someone above the age of 70. And say you work in places or you're in an area where there's a lot of elderly people passing by, <laughs> to what extent do you have to get up? And, you know, yeah, that, that's a very excellent uh, question. Uh, logically, you know, there's no particular excuse not to get up. If it happens a million times, it happens a million times. But the halachic heter that we use not to do that uh, is the idea that it's understood in most of society that the zakein is mochel and does not expect you to do it, and mechila is valid. Same thing with parents. According to halacha, you are supposed to stand up every time your parent enters a room. So if you're living at home, every time a mother or father come into a room, you are obligated to stand up. Now, it's very, very rare, even in the most from households, that that's going to happen. I mean, you're living at home, with, et cetera. And the heter is that the parents, are, are we assume, are generally mocha. That would be the heter uh, there, there as well. Um, but you're right. Technically, there is no heter. Now, I remember reading a Maisa from Ephraim Moser, and, I, and I, I don't understand the I mean, it makes sense to me, but I don't know why it makes sense to me. I mean, it makes sense pragmatically, but halakhically, I'm not sure. You know, there is a halakha that when a poor person directly asks you for tzedakah, directly, says something, you have to give him something. You're not allowed to just walk by him. You can give him a shekel, you can give him very little, but you have to give him something. So Rav Chaim Moser said that when he lived in a small town before he came to Vilna, every time he would see an Oni, he would always give. But he said in Vilna that became impossible, kind of like here, because uh, every, uh, every two feet, you know, somebody puts out his hand. So Rav Chaim Moser says, in such a situation, you're putter. I mean, it makes, I mean, I understand, because otherwise you'd be giving out money the whole day, but I'm not sure why you're putter. I mean, I'm not sure what the hetter is and how crowded it has to be. He said the same thing about saying good morning. The Gemara says about Rav Yochanan, that Rav Yochanan, ne- no, nobody ever greeted Rav Yochanan before Rav Yochanan greeted them. He greeted everybody first, and even Nachri Bashuk, even a guy in the, in, the, in the marketplace, Rav Yochanan greeted him first. So Rav Chaim Eiser said he used to greet everybody. But in Vilna, he said it was impossible. And what do you do? You're walking by... Uh, <laughs> I mean, you're walking on Ben Yehuda Street. <laughs> hi, 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 hi. <laughs> yeah. So at some point, there is a realization that you can't do it, but I, I, I don't know exactly, 
you know, how you define that situation. But there is such a, such a swarry, yeah. Also, Pirkei uh, Avos says that a person is a Ben Meir Kiyu Met. Like we know, like in Judaism, the more older a person gets, the more you respect him. And so I see that like, in the Pirkei Avos over here, like the more, it gets more and more like kind of like almost mm-hmm. cynical or like kind of like, you know, like yeah, yeah, yeah. Standards. This is a hard Mishnah, the, right? The Mishnah in Pirkei Avos goes through uh, the different da- in the different stages of man. When you're five, you start learning Chumash, and 10, Mishnah, and 15, Gemara, and then 20, you get, you know, 18, you get married, 13 is mitzvahs, and uh, 18, you get married, etc. And it goes through all the ages, and it goes all the way to 100. And each age, all right, so by 90 already, it says, you know, 80 is inner strength. He says, 90 is you're bent over. Okay, it's already a little pessimistic. Then 100 says, ah, it's as if you're dead and no longer, no longer in the world. So, you know, you read that literally, and it's kind of saying, oh, the guy's 100, you know, he's already a goner. Um, so, <laughs> obviously that's not the case. Obviously, for, first of all, for a person to live to 100 in ancient times was, I mean, in the Torah, people lived much longer, but, but by the time of Chazal, it was not a common thing. Uh, even for a person to live to 70 was a very big, big accomplishment. But the way it's, it's understood is that a person has to, th- meaning he has to think about the fact that by definition his time is limited and therefore his avayda right now is tshuva. Meaning there's a time in your life where you're still supposed to be, I mean, tshuva we have to think about all the time, but there's a time in my life where my energies have to be directed to a lot of outside things. By the time you hit that age, the outside world is not your purview anymore. Your world has to be your internal world. So it's really giving a person a message that think about your internal ruchnias because you're going to be meeting Hashem very, very soon. So it's not putting him down, it's just giving him a sense of what his mission is at that point. And that's also important psychologically because let me explain something. One of the issues that uh, we face in old age is we do face you know, diminished capacities. We can't do all the stuff that we used to do. Well, we can't do it. In Baruch Hashem, you guys are still young, so you haven't experienced it, but it's a reality. It's a reality. And so that can make a person very depressed. Oh, I used to be able to do this. I used to be able to do this. But you have to understand, Hashem gives you a different role at each stage in your life. So the fact that I can't do what I did when I was at a younger stage doesn't mean my life is without value. It just means I've got to find a new value for my life. So here you have a 100-year-old person. There's not that much a 100-year-old person can really do. But he can focus on his ruchnias. And that's his job. Now, I remember reading something about Rav Gifter that uh, it, it's very sad on one level, but to me it was also very, very moving. Towards the end of his life, and he was not 100, but he was you know, older, he was not a, you know, Rav Gifter was a brilliant a godol, and a, he had complicated shiurim, pilpulim. But at some point, uh, it, it meant or so, something, he just couldn't, he couldn't do that anymore. So he used to sit in the base medrash, and all he could do was learn Gemara and Rashi. And he would learn Gemara and Rashi the whole day. And somebody, I don't know how somebody brought it up, somebody said, gee, it must be so sad that you used to be in all the Rishonim and all the Achronim, and now you only learn Gemara and Rashi. He said, no. It reminds him of when he was a young teenager just beginning to learn Gemara, where he didn't yet know all the Mephorshim. And it was just the pure joy of just learning Pshat. And he said he's able to experience that again. So he said he feels like he felt when he was 12 years old or 13 years old. And that's an extraordinarily beautiful statement, because on one hand, he was so much more limited than he had been. But he saw the joy in it. He saw the goodness in it. He saw the bracha in it. That's the madrega. I mean, that's one of the reasons why he's a gadol, because he's not just a gadol because he was brilliant. He was a gadol because he saw the, the goodness of Hashem, even in the difficulties in his life. And that's something to think about when you're 190, you know, because, you know, you will have diminished, I mean, listen, I, I mean, I, I know it now. You have diminished capacities in, in various ways, but you have to redefine the, uh, the mission. Yeah. It seems to me that oftentimes in the halakha, there's a suffix of the halakha as to what the halakha is. 
it's good to take the opinion, if you should be more mocking here, that if you have to say both or multiple opinions. So I was wondering with Tehala, if, you know, if there's a subject, whether Tehala is really Tehala or not, it doesn't possible the tzitzi, um, and your Yotze multiple opinions, yeah. you want to do it. Yeah, you know, I, I, uh, you know, this is a really re-election question, and I, I've raised this many, many times, that I don't wear Tehalas, but I don't know why I don't wear Tehalas. I, I can't really defend it, other than the Gedolim have not told me to wear it. And that is, it seems to be a no-cost proposition, uh, because it either is or it isn't. Okay? So let's assume that it's a 50-50. All right. So if I'm wearing Tehalas, that is Tehalas, I'm, I'm just a, uh, restating your question. I have a mitzvah del raisa. If it's not techeles, I have blue tzitzis. But blue tzitzis are not puzzle. Right? Now, the Ramah does say, lechat chila tzitzis should be white, except for the techeles. But that's a lechat chila, that's not a psal. So, lechaira, even if there's only a 50% chance, even if there's only a 10% chance, even if there's only a 5% chance, why? Shouldn't I wear tefillahs just in case? Because there's no downside. If the pshat would be fake tefillahs, would possible the tzitzes, then I could say, oh, if I don't know, I'm not going to do something that causes me to lose the mitzvah. But if that's not the case, and that is not the case, then why not? Very excellent question. I don't have a clear answer. I mean, the answer that people give, well, one answer is, well, if it's not tefillahs, you're transgressing the Avera of adding to the Torah, Baal Tosef. I, I, honestly, I, I honestly do not, that does not make sense to me at all. Because if I'm doing something because maybe it's a mitzvah, there's no Baal Tosef. If me Suffolk, you're doing something to be Yotze a mitzvah. So Baal Tosef is not Shaykh. Another thing people say is that they're so sure that this is not the Chalas, that it's not a suffix, it's not a 1% chance, it's a 0% chance. I heard Rabbi Reisman, not, not our Rabbi Reisman, the Reisman of, well, he's also our Rabbi Reisman, the Rabbi Reisman in Flatbush, uh, just said, you don't have to wear Tehillahs because there's zero chance that it's Tehillahs. Well, I agree that if it's zero chance that it's Tehillahs, you don't have to wear it. I agree. But how can he say there's a zero chance? I mean, the articles are written, they bring riots, they have proofs. I mean, you could argue with the proofs, but, but it's not frivolous, it's not nonsensical. But that's what he says. He says, it's a zero chance, why do I have to follow something that's a zero chance? So I'll tell you the truth, I, I, you know, I, I hate to say it, I don't have a good answer. Uh, it seems to me, exactly as you're saying, that it's a no-cost proposition. Yeah? Is it possible that the zero percent chance is relying on the Arizo? In other words, because the Arizal says that we're not going to have Tehillahs till Mashiach comes, right. so automatically it's got to be, well, okay, all of a sudden, but, but all of a sudden uh, the Litvish have become a Kubalim, you know, you know all of a, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's plenty of things the Arizal says that, yeah. that, that are not followed by Halakha. Now, uh, maybe I, should, I shouldn't say that. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll say it because I, I say things, but... Um, the, the innovator, first of all, you understand that there are two basic techeluses out there. I hope you know this. There is uh, Radziner techelus, which is used by Breslev, which comes from the cuttlefish, a fish. And then there's the techelus that comes from the murex, which is a shellfish and a snail. Uh, the Radziner techelus, again, I, I don't want to be mostly laws on Breslev, but the Radziner techelus has been largely discredited. And uh, even those who are advocates of techelus other than Breslev itself, do not consider that to even be a valid option. But the murex techelis, the shellfish techelis, uh, does have uh, support uh, in it. And the ones that kind of brought it to the fore were in the Dati Liumi community. Uh, they're the ones who pushed it. And I hate to say it, but sometimes in the Haredi world, there's this idea, if it comes from them, it's got to be wrong. <laughs> you know, so, okay, but as I say, I, I'm sure people will say that's a, an unfair accusation, but I sometimes have this feeling that there's almost a gut reaction. It can't be right, because they said it. Yeah. Would you consider carrying on Shabbos if you were to tell us that are not really to tell us? Uh, yeah, so the question becomes, if there's no Erev, or you don't rely on an Erev, so the question would be, would the fake Tehillahs be considered carrying? Um, almost certainly not, because uh, when a garment is dyed, I mean, listen, uh, uh, you know, you wear anything that has dye on it, 
the dye is a bottle to the garment. So if the garment is not carrying, you don't look at the dye as a separate entity. So it's true that there are cases where tzitzis can become carrying. For example, if your talus got puzzle on Shabbos. So wearing a puzzle talus on Shabbos might be carrying the tzitzis. That, that is correct. So your concept is a correct concept, but I don't think you could apply it to uh, something like techelis, like dye that is absorbed in, in, in the fabric. Yeah. That's a question sent in. <coughs> when it comes to Gula, to Dava Nilamuka at the Kemer of the U.S. of the Seal, uh, what is the origin and why, do people, why is this a Gula done? And surely there's a rumor that maybe uh, Yonah Sambad Uziel was never married. Is this for a uh, rumor of the truth? Yeah, yeah. So the truth of the matter is, the second question is kind of is, is kind of the answer to the first question. First of all, Yonas ben Uziel was the greatest. The Mishnah, the Gemara in Sukkah says, Brisa, that Hillel Hazaken, the great Hillel, had eighty Talmidim. The lowest of them was the great Rav Yochanan ben Zaka, who knew everything, and the highest of them was Yonas ben Uziel whose Kedusha was so great that when he would learn Torah, the angels would come and listen, and a bird who would fly over the fire of the angels would get burnt. The belt likes to say that the difference between a chassid and a misnaget is what is your response to that story? A chassid would say, look at the holiness of Yanis and ben Uziel, that even the angels of heaven come to hear his Torah and uh, the bird gets burnt. A litvak would say, who has to pay for the bird? Who's chayef to pay? If Yenis and Nezil caused the bird to be burnt, if the bird belongs to somebody, is he chayef or is it the right? So the Litvak will analyze it in terms of the halachic standpoint. Uh, but Yenis and Nezil was a phenomenally great. Uh, we have the Targum on the Vim, that is from Yenis and Benuzil. And we also have on the Chumash, Targum Yenison, but that's a machlaikis, is that Yenis and Benuzil? Because the Gemara Megillah says he wrote on the Vim and not on Torah, right? So that, that's a machlokas, who wrote the Targum Yenisen on the Torah. Uh, but be it as it may, you are correct, he is buried uh, in Amuka, uh, which is a deep, deep valley near Tzfat. And it is brought down that it is a segula to pray for Shiduchim. Uh, of course, sometimes people facilitate the process. A lot of people just forget their sedurim there with their name, address, and phone number. Uh, and. Uh, <laughs> Then, hopefully, a member of the opposite gender wants to fulfill the mitzvah of Hashavas Aveda and say, hey, are you uh, Rami? You know, uh, I found your sitter. Either way, boy, girl, girl, boy, I found your sitter. I want to be Mikabal Hashavas Aveda. Maybe we can meet at the pizza place on 13th Avenue. Hashavas Aveda only, etc. And they say marriages have happened uh, that way. Uh, but it is brought down. Uh, I, I have to go ref refresh my memory that it is brought down that Yenis Menuziel never married. And as a result, there was a certain loneliness in his life. But he took his tsar and he said, let it be a sechus and a kapara for all other Jewish people who are suffering the loneliness of not following their mates. And that's why he's especially mavakesh rachamim for those who need a, need a shidduch. So it is considered to be a school of that. But why he didn't get married, I have to check. I, I don't remember the reason. Uh, perhaps it was similar to Ben Azai. It is recorded that when the Gemara discusses Puravu, Ben Azai said he didn't get married. And he said, Ma Esa, what can I do? Nafshi Chashka B'Torah. My soul so much desires to learn, I can't get married. That we used to call uh, in Ere Yisrael the older bachelors who were not yet married. We used to call them, oh, they're members of the Ben Azai club. Nafsham Chashka B'Torah. Uh, so maybe Yonis and Mazil have the same cheshman. I'm not sure. I'll, I'll try to check and maybe get back to you. Uh, I will say one thing about Tysus, though. I want to bring this out. Tysus and Yavamis brings from a medrash that Ben Azai did get married, but he was divorced. Ben Azai married Rabbi Akiva's daughter and got divorced. So here is what I think. This is mamish speculation. I have no makor for this at all. And maybe I'm just making up a Baba Misa. But if you were a Ben Azai, Ben Azai says, I don't want to get married. I want, some, I want to learn. All I want to do is learn. But I got to get married. So I have to find a woman in the world who would be most tolerant of just letting me learn. 
So he figures, hmm, Rabbi Akiva's daughter, because Rabbi Akiva's wife let her husband go away for 24 years to learn Torah. If the daughter's like her mother, that's perfect wife. So he married Rabbi Akiva's daughter. The problem was, again, maybe I'm just speculating, that Rabbi Akiva's daughter saw all the pain that her mother went through, and she was not prepared to live that way. And therefore, she needed a husband who was more there, so the shidduch was not able to, to work out. Again, this is just mommy speculation, but it was such a curiosity to me that Badafka, the woman that he married, was Rabbi Akiva's daughter, and they got divorced. So this is what Taisa brings in Yuvamas, without giving us the reasons uh, for any, uh, any of that. Okay, uh, I guess we're uh, wrapping up. Uh, last question, yeah. Um, this is the same thing as well. Uh, Mr. Dress says it's common in the lanes of Ashkenaz to put a Shlisi, the uh, picture of Nora with names of Shem written in it. It's a Durham in it, and uh, basically, yeah. However, um, I've only seen this in Sephardi, the Durham in Batiknasius. Um, when and why did this practice stop in Ashkenaz? Yeah, yeah, so the, the issue of Shivisi, right, that's the Pusik that says Shivisi Hashem, the Negdi Tamid, I place God before me at all times to visualize the Shem Havaya. And there's a picture of a menorah, that, and you can see it at the back of some Sidorim uh, that uh, has these psukim and has the Shem Avaya and the like. Uh, you'll see it in Sephardi shows. You'll see it in some Ashkenazi shows. You're not going to see it uh, that often, like we don't have one here, for example, most yeshivas. And the question is, since the Mishnah Brewer says that it was a prevalent min of, of Ashkenazim to also have a shivisi, so why did it fall out of common... Uh, use and common uh, practice. Um, you know, I, I, I don't know. I don't know because uh, you are correct. The older, the older Bate Kinesiot, in fact, did have it. Um, what happens, well, again, I mean, sometimes I just have to guess. I mean, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of a guess. And that is, what happened in the aftermath of Shapsai Tzvi was that Ashkenazic congregations tried to erase a lot of connections to Kabbalistic ideas because Kabbalistic ideas were dangerous in terms of in, uh, exciting false messianic predictions. Uh, and that is why some minhagim that were miyusad in Kabbalah kind of got discarded in the aftermath of Shabzai Tzvi. I'm wondering, although the Mishra was after that, but, but, I'm, but the Mishra was probably recording an earlier source. I'm wondering if that earlier source was pre Shabzai Tzvi because it could be that as a result of the Shapsai Tzvi, some of those Kabbalistic minhagim got minimized. But I'll, I'll try to check. Check into that.